So uh, Rowan, thank you for joining me on the Neurodiverse Sport podcast or YouTube video, depending on where people are going to, to watch it or listen to it. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about yourself? I, uh, yes, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. It's a very honour to be on this podcast and the amazing work the neurodiversity in sport team does. So thank you for letting me have the opportunity to share my story. A story which is um, probably 22 years in the making, really. So I'm uh, 22 years old, living in Bristol. Um, and I'm, I'm a judoka in the sports of judo, but I'm also uh, neurodivergent and disabled with conditions such as dyslexia, dyspatia, and cerebral palsy, which are all very nicely go hand in hand, making this up here, my brain, very unique. Um, but they also had adverse consequences for my sport. So I took so I took up judo at age eleven, and I was since then have been able to go on to be a member of the Adaptive GB squad. I also work within the field of uh in the field of equality, diversity, and inclusion, and I'm trying. I'm establishing myself as someone who can advocate for the real importance of inclusive spaces because I, I know how much it done for me and I'm sure we will discuss. So I'm really keen to share my story, share the impact it's had on me as an individual and that hopefully the dream is to inspire individuals similar to how I was to take up sports or look at their own communities and go how do we make this inclusive I think that is a fantastic story and one that shows despite um, any diagnosis or disabilities you might have that you can find spaces um, that yep. enable you to flourish which is really lovely to hear yeah the, thank you um i think there's a lot of bases out there that fantastic work but there's still more that need to be done so for me particularly within judo uh my judo wasn't the first sport we tried my i was quite an easy teenager and mum wanted me to take up a hobby get into sport um so we tried trampolining, football, hockey, swimming for a couple of years. And for no reason, none of them really suck. Um, and I, d I just didn't really work for me. And then my mum one day turned around to me and said, do you, and I remember the conversation. It was on the sofa in the lounge. Um, and she said, do you want to take up judo? There's a, at that time, it was called uh special needs even though i don't like that term that was the name of the club it was special needs judo club uh and i said yeah what what judo but anyway we went along and there was this most amazing coach my sensei who sadly no longer with us um got us on the mat and ever since that first session i absolutely loved it and because it was a session built for people like me, so we had more one-to-one -one support. I was able to acknowledge where I had disadvantages. So my disability, the neurodivergent, being my balance is affected. My reactions are not that great. And so it, my hand-eye coordination is not fantastic, but it was that was okay for, and it made me feel like, as an 11 year old who still figure with him so well, um, able to enjoy sport. So yeah, the, the, that's definitely is tricky and you beat the parents in similar situations. Trying to find the white right inclusive base is really difficult. And I think the more we can spread awareness, because I'm a firm believer that building an inclusive space is easy. You just got a bed how and why. 
And I think people were naturally invested. We just got to get over that for a turn up. What do you think it is that is... Um... So I agree that I think it is easy to make spaces inclusive. But what do you think it is that is the barrier for other people to make spaces inclusive? I think I think there's more. I think one is awareness. I think people may not know why or how or why it's important. Um, I chat to people in the spot and it's they're really supportive, but until, until I think it's a messaging thing. Going back before all of that, I think it's a messaging thing. I think in today's society, um, the media and society might rather go, wow, this is amazing, and we just had the power Olympics. They go, wow, this is amazing. Look at this fantastic power Olympian. And it says he's had this condition. And it sort of overlooks what, why that was a barrier, and why it's so major. Well, actually, I think there should be more emphasis on, well, this means that you can't do this and this, and the support you need is this and this. And if we check that message in just a little bit, it really shows why, what barriers there are. Because most coaches in the UK, uh, particularly within my bar, are volunteers, and they do fantastic work. But if we can just make them aware of barriers and differences, like uh, my, me and my coach has had 10 years of back and forth of, well, okay, you can't do this, but let's do that. But there's that willingness to adapt and change and go, okay, we just have to tweak it a little bit. And I think the main thing is just, again, going over it is awareness. There were deeper issues, of course, the resources, so there should be a bigger push for coach education. Um, and But the third barrier is education. Like, is... Do you think that sometimes, and this is what I think, so please feel free to disagree with me, but do you think neurotypical people or people who don't, have any experience with neurodivergent or um, people with physical disabilities, do you think they are scared of doing the wrong thing and saying the wrong thing? Yeah, but I wouldn't be. I think so. I think there's a lot of, I think a lot of people worry that they're, they're sort of an attitude of let's wrap them up in bubble wrap. You know, let's, the the general well actually for neurodivergent people they're like neurotypical but they think differently. And I, I, I don't know how do I word this? So for me, instance, I'm neurodivergent, but I would quite happily go to Poland on the training camp, a mainstream training camp, and get my arse handed to me, and you know. But I'm able to do that because I'm I know myself. But I think some coaches go, oh, no, he's not able to do that because of this, because of this condition. And yes, of course, for some conditions and severities that is needed, there is always levels to it and adjustment needed. So maybe uh, I know in judo we have a five level system. We had level one, level one and two, which is myself, where we could compete main team. But we fight each other as hard as we can. Level three are maybe they need uh, more one-to-one support and care on the side of the mat, a bit more time. And then level five is your, they can't walk or they have to be held on and off the mat and just need a couple that extra support. So there is never an argument, but I think for... Normal typical people who are physically able, I think there is that almost attitude of, oh, they're this, so we got to look after them to them, where actually, no, they're perfectly capable of doing that, but that misconception of saying the one thing, you're doing the one thing, or overprotecting them, it can be quite. Um, 
that can build a barrier itself. And actually, I think a lot of the time um, for neurodivergence is people look for this toolkit approach, I call it. So they go, oh, I've got a person where I've got an athlete here with autism. Where's the toolkit? Where's the magical guidance that says, this is what you do? Where, as me and you know, when you meet one person with autism, you will just met that one person with autism because we're all different. So it's impossible to have that toolkit approach. Yet you have to learn the individual and understand the individual themselves. And then you can go, right, you can do this, we can do that, and you can learn the limit rather than the preconceived one. I think the idea of people search for that toolkit is so true. Um, And it's like everything in life. There isn't one answer for everyone's problem, even if it's the same problem because of how they deal with it. And that's regardless of whether someone's neurotypical or neurodivergent. But I think when you've got that neurodivergent element in there, it is that desperation to not get it wrong to not offend to protect and there's all these extra layers that I think people are are searching for when really as you say it is about having that conversation with the person and and setting kind of the expectations maybe of what the person can expect from a coach and, and what a coach can expect from them in terms of whether they do need a bit more support like you say with the levels um I did wonder, if you don't mind going back, I know you mentioned you tried a few other sports before you found judo. Do you remember what it what it was about the other sports? Was it an inclusivity thing or was it that the sports actually just didn't excite you? I think, um, to be honest, to go back a long time, so I was on judo in heaven, so there'd be be a a single digit. But I think mainly it was... um, didn't we excite me or weren't adapted to me? I think in my swimming in particular, I did that for a couple of years, but I think it got to a level where I wasn't um, progressing as much as I wanted to. And even as a kid, one of my biggest strengths is my ambition. So I would always want to do better than the last session. And... Um, because I didn't know myself and I got frustrated and ended up leaving the session. Well, now I'm older, I understand I'm not going to progress as quickly as I want because there's barriers in pace. Like, you do know my balance, my uh, coordination and uh, reaction times are the name key area of the judo. But I'm still going to be making progress and it building that patience and that confidence. Um, I think that's the key thing around neurodivergence in general is having that confidence within the sport that even though something I used to really struggle with in my judo and in sports is as a kid you compare yourself to your peers. So you look to these amazing athletes who are neurotypical and just training and training and you go, why can't I be like that? And my coach would always tell me, he must have told me about a hundred times, um, don't compare yourself to them. You know, it is, it's good, but also you have to accept yourself. You have to accept and you. You can be that good one day, hopefully. He's so much better than me, he's full cast. But um, yeah, one day you can be that good. You just have to accept you on your own individual journey. And it's rebuilding that confidence. And that's the amazing thing. One of the amazing things of our inclusive basis is that they build that confidence in a person. In anyone, neurotypical, but especially neurodivergent, because in society, we we operate in a society that isn't designed for us. It's designed for the neurotypical. So day to day life, if you make a mistake or you do something silly, or sorry, you don't do something silly, you 
do something that isn't neurotypical that people view as silly or that can make yourself not yourself a scene because it's not the norm. So heavy quotation marks and around that. But being able to go to that sports club and being viewed and having that confidence to go, no, I'm on my own journey. I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine doing as I'm doing is a massive thing. And I think particularly for me in my sport, that's one thing it massively taught me, having that confidence to go, no, what I'm actually doing is completely fine. I'm just doing it my way. Like everybody else is. They're all doing it their own way. Just happened that I'm neurodivergent with three conditions that mean that my my journey is unique. I um I'm smiling because it resonates a lot with my experience as well. Um and just that often I would so I'm autistic and I have ADHD. They're my two neurodivergents. Um, I was only diagnosed two years ago. But throughout my life, I have done things that other people have not understood. And really, I've not understood either. Mm. And regardless of a diagnosis or not, it is that thing where you, you do something, you are different. And that is very hard when it comes to building confidence in every aspect of life. And you're always over, or for me, I was always overthinking all the things that I did and the replaying them in my head and how people interpreted them. But when you find a sport, so for yourself, it's judo and mime at horse riding. And it can make, well, it made me feel at peace, helping me feel quite grounded as well mm. and using my body in a way that kind of, I'm not sure how to explain it, but made me feel normal. I think that's the massive thing about sport and inclusive basis is my, my biggest, the thing I will always, always be grateful for my sport for, and I had so many opportunities. I, I bought the GB at that, this one, so I get to travel the world, compete, train, I met so many amazing people. I it helped me through. But the one thing why I will do judo for the rest of my life, not only because I enjoy it, but my biggest challenge in life so far was during my education. So particularly in secondary, from I got really badly bullied from year seven to year year eleven for five years. I it was. I went there, so looking back, I don't know how I kept going, but I just kept going. And I tell her, I, I do know how I was going, uh, kept going, and that was because of my boss. So I got kind of badly bullied, because during my education, I was a different kid. Again, quotation marks, different. Um, and I was, I had a full-time teaching assistant who used to be in every lesson, because I had quite a bad tremor in my hand. I did. I did now saw it most of it. Still have difficulties. But it means I don't wipe. I refuse to wipe with a pen. Just of my hand wiping. It take me forever. Um, so she, wonderful woman, just used to swipe and we helped me out in lessons. But because of that, other kids um, saw me as different. And we all know how kids in school are, uh, particularly at that age, you're different, you're weird. And you know, I was the easy target. So I went through my education getting really badly bullied, mostly mentally, so comments, just you know, comments here and there, poking, sometimes physical. Um, and it was constant, it was all day. Um, but being able to have that spot, I remember when I got quite good at the Saturday class, I was probably at the top of it just because I was a man in some kidney. And my coach for months said, you need to come to this session. It was a, and I was a bit hesitant at first because it was on a Wednesday night 
and it was a mainstream session, so it was a neurotypical session, uh, and um, I was a bit hesitant, so it took a few months to build up to it, but then I went, and I met so many, I made friends, I was training, and it was, it was the senior cast, and we were people older than me, I was the youngest by eight years, I think, I think I still am somehow, um, and, um, <laughs> so, and, um, I keep, but having that area with people who are mature, we were chatting to adults, and somewhere where everybody, they, in the nicest way possible, they just didn't care about my conditions, or if I did something differently, they all accepted it, they were all inclusive, and that Wednesday night, I remember, no matter how badly the bullying in the education got, or how badly I wanted to leave school, or how badly I just didn't want to do it anymore, um, I always remember telling myself to get to Wednesday night, get to Saturday, to that judo, that where I can be myself, and it, again, going back to that confidence, and uh, with you and half it gave me that confidence, knowing that I'm perfectly fine, it's honest, it's just the way they view me, and it gave me that self-confidence, and uh, one thing with you, it's the art of throwing, <laughs> so you get thrown, and you have to get back up, but not only did that team me physically to get back up, um, Mentally, it also taught me why tomorrow's another day to get back up, go again, to go again, to go again. And uh, even today, when I, uh, to about a year ago, I realised I still cared and worried about what people think about me. Having that spot to really be myself where no, no one cares because I had that for my bullying, because I used to, people used to go to me, or oh, don't give them any ammunition. Just put your fall field up. Because the education system, it, particularly in my experience, it didn't actually adjust the issue. It didn't adjust the bullying. They went, okay, everybody bullying. Let's just take the victim, me, and let's just change him, and let's, try changing rather than actually dealing with the consequence with the cause of it um but having that spot to go back to and be myself was just amazing it sounds like you definitely found a place with judo oh, oh yeah yeah definitely and i know you said you're going to poland shortly is it tomorrow yeah. i think yeah so I, I leave this evening for London to fly out tomorrow morning uh, for the third round of with my GB uh, squad to compete in Poland in Gdansk uh, because this year, uh, rather amazingly, the European Judo Union, which is one body below the top tier one, has um, for the first time ever put a European competition circuit together all around Europe. So people like myself in adapted judo and who are no more diversion, disabled, um, can go and actually compete against people like themselves. And so far this year, I've been to um, uh, Croatia, Zagreb, that we just have one in Swansea. The next one is this weekend in Gdansk, Poland, and uh, then we go to Renway in Netherlands. And then next year, uh, the calendar hasn't been announced yet, but there's going to be even more. And it's fantastic because this is a real body putting money into adaptive sports and resources. And it's amazing. I, even though I wasn't competing, I would still go because seeing that inclusive base of neurodivergent and just athletes all together from all different countries. That first ever one, we had the uh, athlete from Japan. Well, we're just amazing. Japan is the birthplace of um, 
spot of judo. So to see them in Europe competing on this inclusive circuit, it just showed the the power of inclusion and that there is an audience for it. It just needs to be done. Yeah, and is that kind of your your biggest thing, do you think, for sport in general, is to sort of follow that idea of making or creating the platforms where people can come together and practice? Yeah, I think, yes, I think absolutely at all levels. I think if if there's someone watching my Olympic goal, if someone watches this and sees what I do, and they're in a similar situation to me or not, but they all know we're divergent or disabled, and they decide to take up sport, that's amazing. That's because I, I, I know how much it's done for me, so I know how much it can do for someone. You, you never have to tell me the importance of sport of inclusion because I know what it's done for me. And for others in my cards, in, in adaptive judo and across the UK. So, yeah, my biggest thing is not just sports, but I know this is neurodiversity in sports, um, but all areas of life, just putting that effort in to make basis truly inclusive. Because we're not, we're not chatting about, I know technically we're a minority, but I would argue that because I think I said the other day, one in five people are neurodivergent. Um, for, I forgot the exact percentage, but not percentage of people consider them disabled. So to tighten with the minority, not exactly true because it's a low percentage of the population. So there is that audience, but there need to be more done in sports in general too so people can enjoy sports because it has so many benefits the biggest one being confidence it gives them a safe space it gives them something to be passionate about and i think especially for neurodivergent people having that safe base and inclusive in sport environment is vital because Again, we work in a society that isn't designed for us. So I know that is changing in part, not majorly, but there is fantastic work going on out there. It means that we having that extra space to learn ourselves is vital. Yeah, and Did I think... Did that your question? I feel like I went <laughs> off there. No, it does, absolutely. I think yeah. it it's a question that's difficult to have a, a single answer to because it's kind of everyone's responsible at different levels of or different, um, maybe not levels, but different, uh, maybe levels is right, levels of access to sport. Yeah. It's not like it's yeah. just up to a coach or just up to a teacher or, you know, just the government. It, it has to, it's just everybody almost needs to improve their inclusivity. Yeah, I think there's always one, but it's always the harder question to answer when they feel why does inclusion matter? Because the, in my mind, I just want to go because it does. Obviously, it's obvious it matters, but then this is where um, stuff like this is brilliant because you get neurodivergent people together to actually tell their story and um, that people can listen and go, okay, that's why it's important. Having that person perspective, it really helps sales, even though you don't need to sell inclusion. It, so it embeds awareness of inclusion, which is vital. And that quite often will help with editing national bodies yeah they need to do more in they should be doing more uh to promote no more divergent sport and disabled part um but coaches also sometimes having that awareness is all they need uh but there should be coaching education so if they need it or they feel like they need that support they can go get it um so yeah it's, it's a massive journey and it needs to happen across all levels. Uh, I talked the other day on this uh, social media group 
Uh, and I, it made me just laugh and catch it on top. Someone in this neurodivergent and disabled uh, social group was saying, where's the judo club that can cater for me? And then they listed their conditions. And then I went, just mental. Imagine someone neurotypical going, who can cater for me? They can just walk up to every judo club and be accepted. And I think that should be our goal for sports all around the UK. I'm not saying it's easy. In the majority of cases, it is. But, of course, there will be barriers, biases, unconscious biases, and people to overcome, as there always is on the journey of inclusion. But I think that's where we should aim for, as a a cost to board. I think it would be great for every sport to not have those sorts of questions asked about, can Mm. I be catered for? But as a neurodivergent adult, that's what you think about is, well, all of these things and probably all of the reasons that you were bullied as a child are the reasons you can't just walk into a a kind of neurotypical group. I wondered Mm. if you had any advice for parents actually so I know you were 11 when you went and started your judo journey and it was your mum that said let's go try it if there's any parents listening and and I hope that they are and they have children who are diagnosed or undiagnosed but are just you know different and we use the the funny like quotation marks there do you have any advice for them on how they might look to help their child find a place in sport? Yeah, I don't. it's always tricky because I'm not a parent, so I don't have first time at bear reading, but there are, hopefully your parents listening, first of all, you're doing a fantastic job. Secondly, um, I think the main thing you can do um, is just ask. Go out there and ask. Ask the questions. Be up from be the, know what you want, be the, your child has the right to do judo. Do judo? Yes, obviously a bias do judo is the best sport out there. <laughs> do sports in general. They have the right to do as sports. Every child does. So know that and go to clubs and be like, my child has this condition, they may be autism, cerebral palsy, dyspraxia, dyslexia, well, you may not know what it is. And be like, this is what they need, this is how it affects them, can you cater for this? And if they don't go, they should hopefully go, yes, absolutely. But just ask and just make sure you find the right environment, because the right environment can be crucial and vital, because sadly we are in a society where every environment is not not catering for them. So just finding the white right one, and when you find it, just keep finding, keep going. Because when you do find it, it will the effects are amazing. And I can go on all day about, is there something I'm really passionate about? I can go on all day about why the effects are amazing and why it's so worth it. Uh, my my poor mum took me to... Oh, must be double digit spots, different cubs in different spots, trying to find the right one. And when we did, we were in. And also, so we beat to the national body, the national governing body. Um, their most will have, well, all should have a safeguard in our EDI person, get in contact with them because they should know where we'll be where we'll be best. That's a really good piece of advice, actually, about contacting the the sort of national governing bodies. Where would someone find out information? Would it be a case of going onto Google and and Googling, say, judo governing body or um, swimming governing body? Is that the best way to direct them? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so judo would be judo, but yeah, national body... Or, again, just ask, if you don't know, um, ask a coach. Most coach, uh, most sport club will quite happily refer you on to them. Um, it's just all about asking. Uh, I I can only really go off Juno here for us. 
it's a bit of judo. You can find them on social media. If you ask any club, I'm sure they won't tell you. And quite often, coaches will go, no, we can't, sorry, but have you tried so-and-so? And then there, you, you, there's always that support. Fantastic. That's great. I think there are lots of people who or children I think who would benefit from finding a sport for all of the reasons that I think you can discuss I can also discuss and mm. I think that being able to almost signpost people to the right resources is is key and to not be afraid as you say to have those conversations um, and yeah. that's got to be one of the biggest things and that's why we're chatting today is it's okay to talk about these challenges and barriers yes yeah, totally. Yeah. It's it's okay to be you, and that one thing. It, it, sadly, that's something you must do. Now. We all go on our unique individual roads. For me, it took me years and years. My mom, my coach, <laughs> my mentors have had years of trying to tell me it's okay to be you. Stop comparing you. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Just accept who you are. And we all go on our each journey to accept that and I think that's the really amazing thing about sport is it really helps with that it, it brings out uh, I honestly w- don't know where I would be today without this sport because it had given me the confidence it had given me the passion it had given me um, my friendship with my life is you know it's just absolutely yes. Um, and that's the power of spot because it, it gives you all that and it helps you know yourself. Even if you go to a spot and go, oh, I don't like this, or it, I don't like this, I don't know that, I don't like this, it teaches you what you don't like, which is another part of yourself learning yourself. Definitely. And it's hard to understand ourselves and the way that our brains work even like ourselves and the way that we think and sometimes identifying what is a challenge is useful in then finding the right place to go or to kind of explore it's really interesting um I'm looking over here because I have two screens I'm not not. (laughs) I was wondering as well I know you said when you um you were doing your judo and you were at the um what was called the special needs judo lessons or club at that time I'm assuming it's now the adaptive judo. Yeah, we um, we have merged it, so we don't have a adaptive Pacific anymore because I the resources and we just don't have a coach to take it on there with that one to bring it on. But it's a lot of commitment, so it's a it's a new journey and uh, it's something we are endeavouring on. Um, but yeah. yeah. It went from best of need to adaptive, adaptive being because um, it's just judo, but you adapt it a bit. Like um, my fighting style was unique to me because I had to adapt it. So I'm not very good on my balance. So I will go, I have been training to fight in a way where I don't go off balance. I don't compromise my balance. And that, that's just adapted judo. It's also known as adapted judo, but I prefer adaptive because it implies it's always ongoing because it is. You always know yourself. And uh, I, I don't particularly like the term better needs. I find they're a bit patronising. Uh, but I love the term be- adaptive judo because it is. It's just judo, but you adapt it. I love that. I think it's... A really nice, much more friendly and inclusive way of defining the difference without being yeah. slightly insulting. So yeah, and I, I think it also removes the barrier going back to the um, cut the like wrapping them up in bubble wrap and being hesitant to get it wrong or whatever. I think it will help remove that because I think there is that symbol around the term special needs. Um, but it also gives coaches the confidence to go, all right, it's a judo, but it's adaptive and it's ongoing. Adapt- it, so it's 
you just choose them. If you do make that mistake or you do do something and it isn't right for the athlete, like, guess what? You're adapting it. You're learning it. it it's just like any other judoka. As far a move may not work, we aren't all robots. And we aren't all robots. So people will always be unique. So just like you would have to go through and maybe teach a neurotypical somewhat, someone differently, you just have to do that, but more with neurodivergent people to truly understand it. And if you get something wrong that doesn't work for them, there's no shame in that because that's all part of learning. I think the big challenge is giving coaches the confidence of what they do best. Because no one teaches better than them, because especially in the UK, most coaches are volunteers. So they're really passionate people who um, I know particularly going off judo. They're, they're some, well, pretty much everybody is an amazing, passionate person who loves the sport, who volunteers. And it's just giving them the confidence to go, you can teach this person because you're, you're the coach, you're the expert. It just is an ongoing thing. So I think you've sort of said it here in, in what you've just answered. But if you had, say, one top tip for a let's stick with judo, because this is what you know and what you're passionate about. Say there is a coach um, somewhere else in the UK or, or in another country even that's listening and they want to look at adaptive judo. What's your biggest kind of piece of advice for them? I think learn that well. I give two. I give one a um, bigger piece of base. Give it a go. Um, I think you adapted judo. There's guidance out there, particularly in judo. There are people you can meet. To. But I think I will come at it from if you have an adaptive athlete on the mat, and I will say again, learn learn them as an individual. Know what they do and what, what they need. Learn them and then once you have learned them, you can help them, you can advance them and you can tailor it to their needs. Just like you would any know I'm not going I'm not a coach, so I wouldn't sit and go teach them this, teach them that, teach them that. But I will just say in neurodiversity and disability in general, learn the individual and go off what they need and work together. And I have patience in that. <laughs> patience, yeah. And with communication, I think patience on themselves as well to, to get it wrong. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, like I said, it's a, it's adapted. It's a learning journey. So I work with um, so a uh, few people uh, and they say, I never work with someone with your conditions. So if it doesn't work for you, feedback to me. And so I do. And it's that ongoing back and forth. Um, but I'm telling you too, so you may not have someone who can do that, particularly, say, if they're a child. So it does take some discretion, and yes, it is that patience to go, oh, OK, I got that one, or, oh, that didn't work, or there's no shame in it. Just keep going with it. Well, with the punches. There's a lot of sayings that have come out of judo, I think. Yeah, I... I don't, wait, well, with the punches isn't one because you don't. Well, get get them back up when you get knocked down. I know you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I did a uh, talk, and that was the title of it because it is. It's just that. It's that what sport teaches you. It's keep getting back up. To keep getting back up. Okay, that didn't go wrong. Okay, I set that onto the next one. I think it's very important to try and tell yourself like we're saying to about coaches that coaches can get it wrong we too can get it wrong sometimes when we're even advocating for ourselves and we just need to carry on yeah i think i think that goes on to spot you yeah, well, no one walks onto a mat or dives into a swimming pool or goes onto a football pitch a baseball pitch tennis pitch wherever wherever venue it is and is the best and can walk up to the Olympics or the World Cup and win it. No, no one can do that. It's everybody learns. 
and it just we all it's that confidence again going back to the theme of confidence having that confidence to go I'm on my own journey I may be a bit slower learner so I'm a really slow learner I will learn a technique and then do it weeks on weeks on weeks and weeks until I get it perfect where some people I'm so jealous of them they can just do it and go well I know that now and then the in spawn when they be doing it on everybody and it's like how 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 um but again, I I I have no worries about that because I accept that's just my journey. I'm on my individual journey, and it, we all learn. It's having that confidence to go. We are learning. Everybody, parents, coaches, athletes, most importantly, um, people who aren't the athlete, like teammates. So that's what also amazing about sport is. It isn't just the uh, the neurodivergent people. It also helps spread the message of inclusivity um, to younger people. I had wonderful conversation going a few weeks ago when a fourteen year old walked up to me and said, "Why are you like this? Why do you do this?" And I explained it to him. And it was a really nice conversation because you can see him engage and go, oh, okay, right, well, that, 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 that. And that, that's part of spreading the awareness. Now, that is an exclusively kids. I have had people older than me come up to me and go, so does this mean you can do this? No, actually, it means this. And it just helped spread the message. And that's why inclusive bases are so important because... It means that people learn and it helps bed that message as awareness. And it's all about learning. That's the beautiful thing about sports is no matter what level you are at, you're learning. You can be a five-time Olympic champion. I bet they to learn something, whether it may just be smaller than the beginner, but they're still learning something. All of the Olympic athletes, they all still have a coach, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. They still all have that person that they, if they're, for lack like of a better word, nagging them, telling them <laughs> what to do, what they need to do. But at the higher level, it becomes more suggestion. So it's like, oh, you do it that way, they do it this way, rather than actually teaching. But that's all part of the coaching journey. Yeah, I think people forget that that even the top of a sport, they do have those kind of coaching type relationships or even if just experimenting with a slight different stance or where your your weight balances or something that could make a difference. It's high over level because especially at the high end of sport, so I compete at the highest level as adapted judo, it is in the highest level as a judo because Currently, there's no pathway into the power limits, but at the moment, it's the highest level in the adaptive genome. And even going even higher in mainstream, I got uh, in mainstream genome, your opponents are constantly developing, but so you still got to keep up the pace. You see it so many times where athletes are on setback, can take it easy. And it go wrong, because it's like that Mike Tyson code. Everybody has a pan until you get punched in the face. So it being able to adapt and the pan always changes. And I know we've spoken a lot about children and the parents, and we've spoken yeah. about coaches and how to create a more inclusive environment. What would you say to any adults that might be listening who are neurodivergent or have a, a physical conditional disability I know people like to sometimes not say they're disabled they have a disability whatever that person thinks that they they have or um, they are what sort of um, advice could you give them to find a space is it the same is it just having conversations with the the sports and the coaches is that the same thing for everyone yeah. really yeah I think Yes, I think you it's having that conversation. It's being confident in yourself, knowing that you have the right to be there. You you are a 
asset and any club that had you would be lucky to have you. So um, having that confidence to have no competitions, and there's no competitions on to your liking, or you get it all the time in sports. People will come up to you with a pitch, and you may not like that pitch, so you have that confidence to go, oh, I don't like that, I'm going to do this. But no, having that <laughs> the accidental theme with this podcast is having that confidence to go, no, I don't like that. This is a wine for me. And we take that time to go, I'm that, I, a judo club uh, sports will be lucky to have me. So let's find what wine for me. And that may take a bit longer, but just keep going because there will be a space out there. That has really touched me, actually, what what you just said about how you are an asset and, you know, a, a team or a sport would be lucky to have you. I've never even myself considered it that way. And I'm somebody who is an advocate for neurodiversity and things, and I've not thought about it like that. So I think that's a very powerful message that you are an asset and you're not a burden. So try and embrace that and reframe your mind. Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um... Yeah, if you're, you're not an asset. I think any sport that is turning away people, um, but they, they may have a waiting list, fair. They, 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 there's a waiting list, fair. But they're turning away people because they are the more divergent or disabled or they don't, for whatever reason, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. With that. They may not have the resources, that's another valid reason, talking about more work team conditions, but then go find somewhere else that it can truly cater for you and just find a way to do it. Because I found my space in my judo club and it I changed my life. And having that white space is amazing. And I know you mentioned as well that um, your... So the at the top now at this ad- adaptive judo, is the yeah. dream to kind of head towards the paras? Is that the the goal? Is that even something that you think your adaptive judo is going to be doing and pursuing? Oh, absolutely! One day adaptive judo will because uh, visually impaired judo is in the Paralympics, and it's amazing. I watched it this weekend. GB did that did amazing. Um, but it will be there one day. But this, like, any, the main element of resource that people, that the journey of inclusion takes, that people don't really appreciate in time. It's going to take time. So for Gino, I think they're looking at Chenny 32 and Chenny 36 for a full enrollment. Don't quote me on that because I don't know if it's official, but it won't be there. For me, as an individual, yeah, it'd be quite cool to go to the Power Olympics, but it's what I based my journey off because um, it's too far away. I, I, I could be doing, I mean, this. I've only been part of the GB club for two years since returning from COVID after four years. That we where my t- journey took off, and I we developed the passion and done, been able to compete and travel the world training, and that's only four years. So I'm not gonna look to the future and be like, oh yes, in fifteen years I'm gonna commit fifty. No, I, I'm at the highest level where I am. If I can go higher, I will compete. I wanna win medals. I wanna do the best I can, and if there is an opportunity to go higher, oh yes, I'm doing it. But the power of Olympics is not not my, it is a dream, but it isn't a dream why I do judo. It isn't why I do judo. I do judo because I enjoy it. I compete in judo because I also enjoy it, but I'm not working towards something that isn't currently achievable. If that makes yeah, sense. It does. And, you know, 20, 32 and 36, that is thinking quite far in mm-hmm. advance. And I suppose you just never know what what will happen during that time. And no one expected a pandemic, but a pandemic happened. Yeah. 
well, I think change. So I yeah. think also with you, because I think it was meant to be sooner. I think it was meant to be 2028, but I got put back. So I think it's a massive goal to commit towards. And also, if it does become achievable, then just like any other Olympian, I will have four years in a band to do it. And then we go from there. But at the moment, it's too early. It would be amazing. And to see adapted judo in the general, in um, Power Olympics in general, would be fantastic. And I will be there either as an athlete or coach or spectator. Yeah, that's lovely. I think regardless of where you are in your own judo journey, the fact that you are committed to being there is is so great. And that shows the power of sport. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's sports a wonderful thing. It's, and particularly neurodivergent because it gives you the biggest thing, confidence. But it just gives so much. We only sat nervous and we've been chatting for, I think, 50 minutes. But there's yeah. so much more it can give someone. And that you can make a podcast that goes on for two months and you would have still only topped the surface. But it is amazing the work that neurodiversity in sports are doing, what I'm trying to do um, with my advocacy and telling my own story. It helps, it, it's all that journey and it's all that journey that will rightly the more, like I said at the beginning, it's one person listened to this and decided to take up sport. That is the be end and end all. For me, that's the dream. Um, because that's one more step to the dream of an inclusive sports community within the UK and all around Europe and, and the world. I think that is a lovely way to end the podcast, actually, in the video interview. You've summed it up so nicely, Rowan. Um, I'm very mindful of your time, so I don't want to keep you for much longer. Um, but is just any final words? Is there any social media links that people could follow you on if they want to follow your journey? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm very active on social media. So if you, my, name, my social media, just my name. If you're interested in hearing more about my story, um, so I'm trying, I've been, I'm also a public speaker, I'm uh, in inclusion and uh, particularly neuro-inclusive and disability-inclusive topics. Uh, if you want to listen to podcasts like such as this I've been on or any inquiries, best way to do that is through um my LinkedIn, Rowan Kinsella, just my name. Uh, my messages are always open, so please do message me. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Ria. Thank you for having me on. No, it's been great to have a chat with you, Rowan, in a bit, a bit more detail about your journey and what we we would like the future to be. It's been great to, yeah. to share your thoughts. We'll put all your links as well in the description. Um, and uh, so people will be able to click through to find your pages and um, read a bit more about you. Um, but we will end the podcast here. So you have been listening to Rowan Kinsella and uh, Rhiannon in conversation for Neurodiverse Sport. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Bye, guys.